Kia ora koutou everyone, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Gala Morris and this morning I wanted to briefly outline a numismatics photogrammetry project that I am undertaking at the University of Auckland with my colleagues Dr Joshua Emmett and Associate Professor Jeremy Armstrong. First I thought I'd start with a little bit of background about the project, how I ended up involved, how I ended up doing it. Um, I finished my master's in ancient history last year at the University of Auckland, and I also have a background in archaeology. My research predominantly focuses on zoo archaeology, but I also have always had an interest in numismatics or the study and collection of currency. In my spare time, I also am a photographer. I'm a, a headshot and wildlife photographer, so there's that aspect as well. And at the university in the ancient history and classics department, we have a numismatics collection of around 270 ancient coins. Most of these coins are of Roman origin, um, but there are also some of Greek origin. This one here with the dolphin is Greek. Uh, very cool. <laughs> I love that there's a dolphin on it. It's so fun. Uh, and yeah, indeed, there are some very cool coins in the ancient uh, in this uh, numismatics collection, but for the most part, the collection has not been digitized yet. So in 2019, I was a graduate teaching assistant for a stage one ancient history course at the university. And as part of their final assignment, students were given access to three Roman coins during tutorials supervised and asked to compare the uh, political representation on the coins and comment on the value of the coins to ancient historians. The ancient coins were a huge hit. The students absolutely loved them. Uh, many of them commented on how special it was to hold something that is 2000 years old and that the experience was really inspiring to them and it made uh, ancient history very real to them. However, of course, once the tutorial was over, they were no longer able to access the physical coin. They couldn't take them home, unfortunately. And they could only refer to uh, this website, um, this numismatics website with um, some coin, some information on it. As you can see, uh, the information is very limited um, and a little bit uninspiring. So this experience sparked a conversation with Jeremy Armstrong, who was lecturing the course at the time. And we thought, what if we took some really high quality 2D images of each coin in the collection, not only for the students to use, but also um, to keep a digital, digital record of the collection. And the results were pretty cool. Um, this coin here is a silver denarius that depicts Octavian. This is the head of Octavian here on the obverse and the goddess victory atop a temple on the reverse, probably signifying Octavian's victory at the Battle of Actium in 33 BC or 32 BC off the top of my head. But we did wonder if there would be a way to replicate that feeling of awe that the students experienced. Um, we weren't sure if 2D images were enough to replicate that feeling of having the physical coin in front of you. All right, trials and tribulations of the project. Uh, 3D data is becoming increasingly utilized in archaeology, and after some discussions with both Jeremy and Josh, um, we decided to experiment with photogrammetry to try and make 3D models of a few of the coins in the collection. We were interested predominantly in two things. Um, first, we wanted to see if it was possible to make high quality digital 3D models of coins. Um, in a way that represented them with enough detail to match a 2D macro image. So with enough image, uh, enough quality to replicate a 2D image. Uh, the second thing we were interested in was whether or not these models could be used as a teaching tool in tutorials. Would they replace or complement uh, the use of actual coins in tutorials? In the name of time, I won't go into too much detail about all aspects of the methodology, but um, this is more of a general overview. And do let me know if you have any questions at the end about the method. I'd be happy to explain anything in more detail if, if you would like. All right, at the beginning of this project, I sought help from fellow graduate student Stacey Middleton, who just spoke. Uh, she was experimenting with macro videogrammetry on lithics at the time. This was um, just over a year ago, I believe. She was using a softbox setup uh, and the software Agisoft Metashape to produce digital 3D models of lithics. The protocol was to place 
the object on a turntable, which you can see here. And this turntable can be controlled by a smartphone. You rotate the object 360 degrees for around 90 seconds. The camera would maintain a closely cropped frame in order to capture both the detail of the object, as well as include the targets that uh, the Metashape software needs to match all of the images together. You then do this rotation uh, four different, at four different camera angles. So one lower, one mid, uh, one high, and one almost above. And then you flip the object upside down to capture the other side. Once all angles are filmed, you import the video into Agisoft Metashape and the software detects the targets within the images. Uh, the software effectively uh, pieces together each individual image using those targets which you would then use to produce a 3D digital model in the software. It's a bit more complicated than that, as I'm sure many of you know, but that's the gist of it. However, this is my first attempt here. You can see the little coin hanging out on the turntable there. However, there were several limitations associated with applying this uh, lithics-focused photogrammetry protocol to coins. First, coins can come in all shapes and sizes. The coins in the university's collection are predominantly round, but they're also relatively small. The edges of each coin are unique because of the individual strike of the die when they were made. Additionally, the images on the obverse and reverse of the coins have a varying topography with different depths and precision in the detail of the image. Coins are also, of course, made of different materials. A silver coin will, will reflect a lot of light, whereas a bronze or copper coin will absorb it and need a higher exposure setting on the camera to capture the detail sufficiently. These coin-specific issues meant that there were several key variables to explore in our setup. Josh developed a coin-specific base with small targets using a piece of foam with a coin-sized slot in the top, which you can see here you can see the coin sort of you know, pressed into that slot there. Uh, the targets surrounding the coin needed to be big enough for the Agisoft, Agisoft Metashape software to, to detect, but small enough for the framing of the shot to capture enough detail of the coin itself to maintain the image quality. The size of the coin meant that we were dealing with macro framing, and even the tiniest movement of the camera would, uh, would cut half of the coin out of the frame. So the framing had to be very, very precise. And, I had to be very careful with when I moved the camera or when I touched it or anything like that to keep the framing correct. Um, you can see the targets there with the green background on top of the turntable. The first variable that we had to experiment with was the coin specific base. It was the first thing that we discovered didn't work as easily as we were hoping for. Agisoft Metashape had difficulty detecting the targets on this initial base type that you see here possibly because the targets were too far away from the coin itself. We're not really sure, maybe not enough targets. The other difficulty was that the coin wasn't stable in the slot, which meant that it could move between slots, uh, sorry, shots, and that the angle of the coin wouldn't necessarily match once it was flipped upside down. It needed to be perfectly vertical. This caused further issues with the software's ability to match the images with one another to create the 3D model, essentially making the images impossible to use. Um, which, you know, trial and error, it makes sense. Josh then developed a new base with smaller targets and a small slot. Let's see if, see, yeah, you can see it here, which uh, while Agisoft still had some difficulty detecting the targets, this method work, worked okay. Josh did have to make some manual changes within the software itself. Um, I'm very sorry, Josh, but we were able to produce a digital 3D model with it, which I will show you now. This videogrammetry method was relatively efficient. It took about 20 minutes to capture all angles of the coin, which isn't too bad. However, the manual labor that Josh had to do on the edgy soft end of things was taking a lot longer. And the digital model, while awesome, wasn't as high definition as we were hoping for, particularly, particularly if it was going to be used as a teaching tool. We wanted, to be, wanted it to be as high quality as possible. So we went back to the drawing board and decided to try a similar protocol, but instead using photogrammetry. This meant that the grunt of the work on the photo capture side of things was um, a little bit more time consuming, but if done well, it meant less work on the software end of things. So for this method, I took 20 images across a full 360 degree rotation at those four different camera angles per side. 
um, which if my maths is correct, equals about 160 um, high quality images per coin. This required me to double check that the image was in focus for every single image and I had to press the shutter every time, 160 times. And I also had to ensure that the angle of the coin remained perfectly vertical throughout all images. This took about an hour per coin, the whole process. And it was definitely a lot more work than the videogrammetry method that we were doing before. It also re did require a lot more of my photography knowledge um, in terms of getting the aperture settings correct. Um, it was hard to find the right exposure, that kind of thing. And it, sometimes it did shift between angles as well. I had to change the settings to try and match the exposure settings of all images, all of the images. I did, however, have more control over all, which was really nice. And I was able to produce a better quality image and that better, uh, better represented the coin compared to the, the videos that we were taking earlier. I also decided to experiment with a new base, as you can see here, using coin-friendly putty, which held the coin securely and kept it really nicely upright, which was good. I also printed larger targets for the software to, det to detect, just to make it a bit easier for the software to do its job, I guess. Um, but I kept the framing really closely cropped. And you can see that the result here is quite nice. Um, I was quite, quite happy with these. Really high quality, which, is, which was really cool. I was, I was really happy with these. Uh, yeah, so by using photography rather than video, I was able to capture really high quality photos with enough data on them uh, that the software could detect the targets and the unique quirks of each coin as well, which, which is quite important. And voila, through this method, Josh and I were able to produce some decent looking models. We were very happy. Um, here is one produced from these images here. Um, in the future, I will probably make the target slightly smaller and I will use a clear putty to reduce the yellow reflection that the yellow putty gave off. This meant that we weren't able to have an accurate re representation of the color of the coin, unfortunately, in the model. So that's something that we'll work on next. All right, part two, using 3D digital coins as a teaching tool. I noticed that I'm running slightly low on time, so I will need to, uh, need to keep this relatively brief, but in 2020, my students in the stage one ancient history course were unable to, the, uh, to view the coins in person due of course to COVID-19 and uh, because all, all learning was online at the time. Because the method for the 3D digital models was still being developed at the beginning of 2020, students were uh, given the high quality 2D image that I had taken um, as well as the numismatics website. So they had these images uh, in the previous year, they, they did not have these images, but in 2020, they did. I noticed almost immediately that the students were far less interested in the ancient coin tutorial than in the previous year though. There was something about seeing those coins in person that inspired them in a way that 2D images could not replicate. No amount of enthusiasm in my voice <laughs> during the tutorials could make up for it. Fast forward to this year, 2021, learning was for the time being in person again, which was great. And the tutors for this course were able to use a variety of resources for the coin assignment tutorial. Students were given uh, the real coins, access to the real coins in person, the 2D high, G, uh, high quality images, the numismatics website, the completed 3D digital models of the coin. Plus we also 3D printed um, a version of, I'm kind of blocking it, hang on, there. Um, <laughs> uh, a 3D printed version of the digital model, which was really cool. Um, we had a, an accurately sized one and also a, a, a blown up one, which was um, really neat. I thought they were cool. From what the tutors have told me, the students weren't too interested in the 2D images or the website, um, which didn't come as too much of a surprise for me. They were, of course, mesmerized by the real deal, as we'd seen in previous years, but they were also interested in the 3D digital model, which was great, even if it was less so, uh, even if they were less interested than the real thing. It seems that while the 3D digital models didn't fully replicate the experience of the real coins, they act as a kind of intermediary between a static 2D image and the physical coin. They are able to capture, to some extent, the intricacies of the coin in a way that the 2D image cannot, the sort of physicality of it. I don't know how to describe that. 
With this being said, the 3D models seemed to work best at um, complementing the use of the real coin. That is, the students can view the real coin in tutorials under supervision and then have access to, to the digital model at home. But I do think there is a promising future for 3D models, um, particularly in places where there isn't a numismatics collection. I often think about how cool it would have been uh, to have accessed these digital models in my high school classics classroom. In New Zealand, NCEA level, third, uh, level three, sorry, has um, NCEA level three classical studies has a Roman art and architecture exam. And secondary schools rely almost entirely on 2D images for this model mod, module. I think that 3D digital models would provide some sense of awe that the students in my stage one university course experienced. Um, and it could ultimately increase the engagement in, uh, in classics and archaeology in high school, which I know that I would have loved as a student. I thought I would have thought that would be really cool. So in conclusion, developing the method for these 3D models was a little bit fiddly. It took a lot of trial and error. Um, there were lots of different variables to work with that were very coin specific. Um, and the other thing is that we've only made models of, of three of the coins of the 100 and, or 270 odd <laughs> numismatics collection. It is time consuming and requires some photography knowledge uh, to capture the level of detail needed for the coins, but with some development, I think this protocol could be accessible and, and ultimately inspire secondary and tertiary students alike. Thank you so much for listening and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thanks.